Hi there and welcome to the latest in our webcast series from Australian Business Lawyers and Advisors. Uh, you're with Lewis Izzo, Managing Director of Sydney Workplace here at Abla. And joining me today is the super sub, uh, Julian Arndt. Uh, Julian Arndt's one of our Associate Directors. He's replacing Kate Thompson, who has come down with quite a, quite a significant flu, which we're suspecting may or may not be COVID, uh, but she's actually isolating in Newcastle. So welcome, Julian. Happy to be here, Lewis. Um, thank you, everyone, for joining us. We've got a very meaty uh, session today uh, in relation to what is effectively the government's IR reform agenda. We've, we've titled the webcast Labor's Jobs and Skills Summit, but that's, that's really, I suppose, just a trigger for discussing what I think many uh, of our clients and uh, other businesses watching are really interested in, which is what, is what are the likely reforms that we should expect in industrial relations this side of Christmas? What are the likely reforms to come? And what impact is that going to have on, on the workplace in the coming years? And, that, and they're the topics we're, we're definitely going to grapple with today. Um, I think uh, before we kick off, uh, I, I'd like to to effectively identify that we're in a in a particularly unique position uh, to to give insight on on this topic because uh, at the end of the day, well, because we, uh, in addition to advising on workplace relations matters for clients day to day, we regularly act for and advise the Australian Chamber of Commerce, Australian Business Industrial, and because of those relationships. Have, have already been giving significant advice on the reforms. Uh, we've been uh, involved in giving feedback to the union movement, to the ACTU, to the government, uh, giving that feedback directly on proposed reforms and in exchanging with those uh, government and union bodies uh, in dialogue about the reforms. Now, now, obviously, we're not here really to talk about that direct engagement and discussions that have been had, but, but there certainly is a, uh, enough material in the public domain based on communications that have been released already from both the ACTU and government for us to give a very good level of insight uh, as to what we can expect and perhaps, Julian, to make some, some bold predictions. Precisely. I mean, you're being slightly coy about, uh, about the involvement. I mean, certainly we've been involved uh, where we can. We will make some predictions about where this is going. And this has been, I mean, the summit is almost, almost a hashtag of the, of the process we're talking about. What Labor Party said they were going to do, um, the discussions about how they're going to do it, and then ultimately what we'll see from here, what they're going to do. So we're going to tackle a few different uh, topics. We have EA termination applications, uh, something that's going to be right up hot on the agenda up front, one of the early changes, that's why it's up front. Fixed term contracts, same job, same pay, flexible working arrangements, uh, reform of bargaining, dealing with insecure work. And finally, a topic which which probably deserves its own webcast is respect at work, just due to the sheer breadth of changes that we're likely to expect. And we won't get through all of the respect at work agenda, but we'll certainly touch on it. If anyone has any questions, please forward them through. I've got the, the iPad and I will try and touch on them as they become relevant. I mean, we've got, we've got seven points up there. They all could be web, webinar topics in That's themselves. True. We'll try and get through, make it punchy and, and let's begin. Yes, exactly. EA termination applications, why well, might kick off, Julian? Um, interesting, like a, few, uh, like a few subject matters that we're going to talk about today, um, the EA termination applications um, is not a matter that was actually subject to the ALP election platform in relation to its, its industrial relations campaign or, or policy. So certainly this is the type of issue that the ACTU had been talking publicly about. It's the type of issue that was likely part of the ALP's policy platform to the last election in 2019, but they were silent on this in, in 2022. Notwithstanding that, the moment that the, um, the ALP succeeded in the election, we started to hear dialogue about this, and it's, it's an outcome of the Jobs and Skills Summit that it's a matter that uh, the government believes needs to be looked at. Um, where there's been a lot of public comments from Minister Burke in relation to concerns about how easily businesses can terminate enterprise agreements. And so this is an area uh, that we're likely to expect reform and reform quickly. So I, I might just set the scene as to what exactly we're talking about. 
what we're talking about are effectively um, circum- circumstances where a business is subject to an enterprise agreement. That enterprise agreement's probably, it has passed its nominal expiry date. Um, it hasn't been renegotiated. There hasn't been a replacement. Often it, it will be the case that there's significant disputation about the replacement agreement. There might actually be bargaining going on. There might be industrial action. Uh, a business may have locked out some of its employees. So we tend to see protracted negotiations and disputation. And eventually an employer might say, well, all of this has become too hard. I'm not satisfied with the industrial instrument that's applicable to my workforce. So I'm actually going to terminate it. I'm going to apply to the commission to terminate the agreement. And provided the commission's satisfied that the termination is appropriate in the circumstances, it's not contrary to the public interest, the commission will terminate the agreement. And what that leads or has led to is a concern, particularly from the union movement, that there is this ability for businesses to almost conveniently tear up existing safety nets. I've I've heard it referred to on the street as the nuclear option. The nuclear Uh, option. The the other (laughs) thing about this, Lewis, is that that, that this option and the way it had been interpreted wasn't always really part in the history of the Fair Work Act, wasn't already, already always part of bargaining. But there was a case, wasn't there, where it sort of, it opened the door that employers might be able to do this in fairly limited circumstances, and we saw more of it. Yeah, that's right. Um, and certainly the rhetoric coming out of a lot of places is that it happens a lot. I'm not sure the evidence really stacks up on that. I'm not sure how common people are actually terminating. Well, well I, think, I think that's the point. Since the Horizon decision, which is the case you're referring to, Julian, in about 2015, um, the, there has been a propensity of businesses to threaten termination of EAs as a bargaining tactic to secure leverage to get union support for a new deal. And that's what the unions are primarily upset about. They're upset that this is being used as a threat in order to finally close a deal and a bargain on terms the unions don't necessarily support. And so they want it torn up. That is not the EAs, the ability to terminate them, torn up. They, they want the regime replaced. Th- that doesn't mean you won't be able to terminate EAs at all. It's just going to be more difficult. And, and we, we do think there'll be some capacity to terminate existing EAs uh, where they're not replaced, probably where it's no longer utilised. There are a number of EA termination applications that occur today where there's no one else employed under the agreement. Um, you, you lodge an application with Fair Work on the papers to have the agreement terminated and it can be done relatively easily. I don't think anyone's offended by that or opposed to it, so that'll probably remain. Particularly where there's employee support, if there are anyone covered <clears> by it. Basically, where there's no one left who wants the EA to continue. Yeah, and and then the the bigger question is, well, what if the EA is genuinely inconsistent with the business running? If it's going to make the business insolvent, if there's an incapacity to pay, um, it's possible that the the government might allow some limited narrow window to terminate in that scenario and then what about other scenarios what about where you've had protracted bargaining where the parties can't reach agreement is there going to be an ability that that's the big question mark um we think that um that is really i I think the first two areas that you've got up there on your slide that'll probably happen there'll be a capability to terminate where it's not utilized or where there's a threat of insolvency. I think the really big one is, is there going to be another window? And um, we're certainly advocating on behalf of uh, many clients and and businesses that there should be still some window to terminate enterprise agreements in certain circumstances, but it perhaps needs to be the case that the test has some, some revision. And it might need to be a demonstration that the termination is in the public interest or is appropriate having regard to a number of factors. But that's where the real ambiguity is. Will there be a third lever? If so, it may need to be the case that in order to terminate the certain commitments, employers need to give commitments about take home pay not being reduced or commitments about um, certain uh, core elements of the the previous EA uh, being maintained for a period of time. But but that's where we're going to see the most uh, input disputation feedback. It's around that third area of capability to terminate. Um, so I think, I think that's EA terminations and what we likely expect. Um, we might move on to fixed term contracts. Um, this, this area um, 
of reform is something that was subject to the ALP's election policy. Um, it feeds into a broader concern that the ALP talks about, which is about job security. And effectively, the view of the government, the view of the ACTU, is that regular use and successive use of fixed term contracts um, is about degrading job security and promotes insecure work. And so there is an opposition from the government and the union to the prevalence of these contracts. Some businesses use them quite regularly, some don't. I do need to concede, I think in some businesses they are used as a replacement for probationary periods in a way. Some businesses like the idea of bringing someone on as a fixed term for a year or so, giving a good hit out to see how they work out, and then looking at permanency, which is probably not how traditionally they have been used. And so there's a real reticence on the part of the union movement and the government to endorse this form of contracting. And so um, what they're saying is that there's going to be some need to limit their usage. Just to fly to the defence of, of fixed term contracts, obviously there's a lot of use of fixed term contracts where there are legitimate reasons why they're being used. For example, work is contingent on particular funding arrangements, that, whether it be from the government or some other source. Uh, whether in the education sector, maybe uh, the, uh, a teaching job is, is only available in circumstances where there are enough students enrolled in a particular course, you get the gig for that course and then um, you, I guess it depends whether the, the students line up the next year. So clearly there are... Maternity leave cover. Maternity leave, a, a great example. So there clearly are legitimate use of fixed term contracts and there are, there are uses which even someone like yourself would say, oh, that's not quite the reason or that's not quite the role of a fixed term contract. The question is whether the, the new legislation will be a, a precise instrument in regulating that difference or whether it's going to be a blunt instrument. And I think that's the challenge for, for business organisations. This is a challenge for the Australian Chamber of Commerce, the, cha the challenge for uh, other organisations like Business New South Wales, Australian Business Industrial, to really make the case to government that there is legitimate uses and you can't just shut down fixed term contracting entirely. Um, the charitable sector, the scientific research sector are big sectors where fixed term contracts are used. They're used to forward benevolent and, and very, um, very kind of worthy causes and undertakings. But because they're so limited to funding that they don't have the, the guarantee or the luxury of just offering someone permanent employment. So that's the and in fact, if you limit fixed term contracting, you may see a, a reduction in jobs being offered in some of those areas. So that, they're the things that, that, that the challenge that needs to be grappled with. Uh, I think we're, we're likely to see some limitation on the, the way you can consecutively use fixed term contracts. So it may be that they can be used initially for a period of a year or up to two years, but it may be that the government seeks to limit how many times they can then be renewed. Um, the, the other uh, area which we really need to watch closely for, and I'm, I'm loath to enter this area because it's always complicated to explain. I'm nervous now. Um, is maximum term contracts. They need to be very clear about this. There are two types of contracts that are used by business. There's what we might call a true fixed term contract. That is, it starts on one date, it finishes on the end date, and it can't be terminated except for circumstances of serious misconduct by a party. And that's what we might call a true fixed term contract. They're less commonly used, believe it or not, than maximum term contracts. Maximum term contracts say there's a start on a start date, the relationship will end on the end date, but either party can still terminate earlier. Now we see them used frequently by business and they, um, they are somewhat different to true fixed term contracts because you can still be subject potentially to unfair dismissal claims with maximum term contracts, uh, even if they're terminated at the end of the expiry date, the, the Fair Work Commission will have a much broader inspection into the way the relationship was structured to determine whether unfair dismissal laws would apply to allowing a maximum of term contract to expire. So what we really need to look for as well is whether fixed term contracts are going to be dealt with in the same way as maximum term contracts. Is the legislation going to recognise these two different forms of contracting? Number of questions that arise there. And businesses will be, need to be very careful about the detail here where you're using time-limited contracts um, to, to, to incorporate both categories. 
what are you going to use going forward that best fits with the, the new legislative regime? And you're going to have to keep your eye on the ball here. We'll be updating clients regularly. And I think um, we, you'll really need to, if you're considering to continue to use these types of engagement, you're going to need to take advice once the reforms come out um, as to what's best for your business. And, and we'll certainly be at the forefront of that. Um, so that's probably fixed term contracting. Um, the, oh, well, there you go. There's maximum term contracts there. So uh, we've, got, we've got a slide dealing with that. Um, we'll move on to a much, um, oh, I was going to say a grey area. They're both grey, aren't they? We'll move on to same job, same pay. Um, there is a broad, high-level government commitment, which is very easy to say and I think very difficult to do in practice, which is the government wants to ensure that contractors or labour hire employees uh, receive no less pay than the employees working for a principal in the same role. Um, and this is this same job, same pay commitment. What's very difficult is actually spelling out who's going to be covered by this and how. And I think you've got some views, Julian. Yeah, well, we, maybe we might just start with the problem again. So because the, cause you're right, it's very easy to say. It also seems like a you know, decent idea. Same job, same pay, do the same work, get the same. Very work, catchy. Yeah, very catchy. Um, <coughs> where, this is a, where this is a thing is where usually in a context where there is an industrial instrument, an enterprise agreement that has been negotiated over time, and it has given rise to a certain set of conditions. Uh, the same employer may use labour hire who are, is not who are not subject to that enterprise agreement with a certain set of conditions. And usually, usually, I won't say invariably, but usually those employees coming in under labour hire are going to be paid less for the same work. Now, what this is trying to get around is two things. One. The, the, the labour hire employee, from a fairness perspective, the argument goes that they should get the same as the other employee. But the other thing that it also guards against is the reduction in work from the enterprise agreement covered employees um, because all the work is going to the cheaper labour hire employees. This is, a, this is a big problem for some people. For other people, it's not going to be a well, big and issue. Look, we can be frank about it. it. This is a major concern for a business like Qantas where it, it has employees in the mothership, you might call, which is the, the, the Qantas Airways P2I limited entity, but then they have lots of other employees performing work for that entity under different companies that are not in the same terms and conditions. It, it's a big issue in the mining sector. Now, the uh, Australian Mines and Mills Association, now ARIA, are already starting to talk about this issue because I think they're quite worried about the extent to which the, this reform, these reforms might start to affect the profitability of mining operations and how, how they're conducted. But there are certain industries where labour hire is quite common. And they're two examples of what the ACTU is really, and the government's really trying to regulate here. I think where, where care needs to be taken is to understand that there are other industries that use contractors or contract labour which aren't the problem industries. And the question is going to become, well, are we going to be regulating all of these industries? Lorry owner drivers in the transport industry is a great example. Um, lots of major transport companies use employee drivers and what we call owner drivers, drivers that own their own vehicle. It's a completely different business model. The owner drivers are paid substantially more, in effect, because they are supplying an asset. They're responsible for fuel and running costs. Is it the idea that all of these operations are now going to be subject to some same job, same pay commitment? And so I think what, again, the, the devil is in the detail. I think it's going to be very difficult for the, the drafting to precisely articulate the problem areas Julian's talking about and carve out the rest. And so anyone using contractors might find that this legislation may have some, some creep into their areas. And again, we, once the drafting becomes available, we have to be very careful about how anyone using contractors is affected. But anyone who has outsourced for reasons of, ec of economics, cost reasons, will be affected by this. Yeah, if there is someone still within that host doing some similar work, presumably. But, but you know, all of this remains to, to play out. I think, um, I think it's going to be a, <clears throat> an area of reform that's probably deferred till after Christmas because it is so complicated. <laughs> Excuse me. I'll, I'll jump in there as you cough up. Uh, 
Senator Roberts has had a go from One Nation. Mm-hmm. Um, he has put forward a, a, a bill which covers this area in a very specific, in actually named specific industries. Um, the feedback for that bill has not been glowing from any quarters. Um, and I think the telling thing is that the ACTU's submission for that bill is to say, no, this isn't going to quite do what we had anticipated. Uh, why don't you withdraw the bill and work with us or with the Labor Party to, to come up with something uh, better? The telling thing in reading that material for me was the fact that the ACTU's submission was, submission was very much directed at a, at an entirety of, of all workers um, on the basis that the principle, same job, same pay, as an equity principle should be, you know, we're not trying to fix, uh, I think these are your words, problem industries. We're trying to fix the, the issue of the equity principle. It's like if you work the same job, you should be paid the same. What they're going to come up with, though, who knows? And I think, um, I think that there's another point that's pertinent to all of these areas. You may, you may have noticed we're talking about the ACT and the government somewhat interchangeably. Um, there's a reason for that, um, although it's not being done deliberately. The, the reason simply is this. I don't think anyone involved in the discussions about the reform, anyone involved in the various organisations we're dealing with, in the uh, employer organisations or even the unions, is in any way under any illusions about where the government's IR reform agenda is coming from. It is very much the ACTU's agenda. There is a very close nexus between Tony Burke's office, or Minister Burke's office, I should say, and the ACTU. There's former ACTU employees in Minister Burke's office. And and I think um, we just need to be realistic that the, the government IR reform agenda is, in fact, the ACTU reform agenda. And yes, there may be some negotiation with the crossbenchers, but I, I don't think um, businesses out there should be under any illusion of the level of synergy and overlap between the government position, and the ACTU position. They are, in effect, o- operating largely at one as the, at the moment. And look, that's a bit of a scare campaign that's that's been mounted by the opposition party to some extent. But to be honest, it, it, it appears to be the truth. But to take the other side of that, I mean, it's on the first point of that slide. I mean, these are these are AOP commitments. The AOP was elected. It's, it's, a lot of this is unsurprising that these are going to be policy positions going through into legislative positions. So in that sense, it shouldn't come as an entire surprise. It's true there's an eerie similarity between some of these policy positions and previous ACTU platforms, but it probably is unsurprising. So um, that's good because we know that this is happening and we'll be prepared when it happens. Um, flexible work arrangements. Um, this is another area that wasn't really the subject of any part of the ALP's election platform. So the opposite of what I just said. Yes, correct. Uh, but, um, but has magically appeared um, in the lead up to the summit and then at the summit as a very big issue. Um, the, the Jobs and Skills Summit outcomes, and there's, a, there's an outcomes paper we have, and if I can move quickly, I may even find the exact wording, but, but the Jobs and Skills Summit outcomes effectively uh, provided that they want stronger access for flexible work, <coughs> working arrangements, um, and he called for immediate action on this. And what, what is not being spelt out in the outcome is exactly what stronger access for flexible working means. But, but uh, I think it could only be two things. Um, Before we get there, Lewis, why don't we just jump back to if everyone's got their Fair Work Acts, Yes. reading along, you go to section 65 and it allows you to make a request if you are part of a certain category of employee uh, for flexible work arrangements. So those categories include uh, older Australians, uh, those experienced or caring for people suffering from domestic violence, family domestic violence. Um, Aged uh, over 55 and people with children. People with school children. age. Disability. Um, and victims of domestic and family violence. The reason why people might not have Section 65 open and they never have looked at it before, is that's actually a relatively underutilised tool. Can I ask you, Lewis, why do you think it's an underutilised tool? So, um, so effectively, you have a right to request under the Act. As Julian said, the employer, if you are one of these protected categories of employees, the employer must respond within 21 days and the employer can refuse, but only on reasonable business grounds. But the reason 
that the section is underutilized is once the employer refuses, there is no ability under the Fair Work Act um, to take any dispute about that refusal to court, to a tribunal. Um, there is no breach or offence or any other way of having the decision by the employer reviewed. Once they've responded within 21 days, that is the end of the story. And so there is certainly a perception, again, at the, within the ACTU and others in the union movement, that the protection conferred by Section 65 of the Act, which is, again, this right to request flexible working arrangements, is a toothless one. And so that's why they're talking about stronger access. And I think that leads on to how you give stronger access. It is probably by making the process for requests and declining those requests more robust. You could involve the Fair Work Commission to arbitrate the process to ensure that where an employer has been required to, to deal with a request that the employer follows the steps. Alternatively, you could actually have the Commission involved in conciliating or mediating or even arbitrating the actual outcome. That is, the Commission will determine whether the request should or shouldn't be accepted. Now, you can imagine the full extent of where this goes. So an employee who might request a flexible working let's arrangement. Take, let's take me. Let's take Julian. Lewis. He likes to work from home. Lewis is my boss. Uh, I have kids and I want to get home. I'm going to do the <laughs> school pickup at 3 p.m. And so I say, Lewis, I want to stop work uh, five days. I want to stop work at two and then I'll log back on, back on at six or whatever. Lewis thinks about it. He might have good grounds. He might have reasonable business grounds. He says, actually, no, I need you to work from two to five. At the moment, I say, oh, okay, thank, thank you for that. Um, now, there might be some discrimination. Yeah, there's, there's discrimination legislation that may sometimes be engaged but here, difficult, but it's quite difficult to access. Unwieldy, not very well accessed. In this new world, I say, I oh, know, Lewis, I will file a form X, Y, Z in the Fair Work Commission, and I want the Commission to determine whether you do in fact have reasonable business grounds to force me to work from two to five. This is a, a very significant potential, uh, p potential, potential, stressing the word, and I'll say it again, uh, outcome or, or, or change in the way that people can access or ask for flexible work arrangements. And, and yes, and if the answer of the reform is the Commission can now impose an outcome on the business, it I mean, in some sense, it's quite an encroachment on the business being told how it should run its business. And the smaller a business gets, the more difficult it's going to be for that business and the more uh, we may hear some significant uh, complaints from the business groups and from, from individuals themselves. There are other ways, though. Um, the government could ensure the commission, like I said earlier, just make sure and can compel employers to comply with the process, to ensure the process is fair for considering or alternatively, could be involved in conciliating outcomes, mediating them without actually imposing an outcome. They are ways that um, more protection could be given or the process could be given a little bit more um, robustness without actually imposing an arbitrated outcome on the employer. And again, this is an area where the, the penny hasn't landed um, yet. There's feedback being given and it is on, it is on business organisations to make the case for why these requests shouldn't be subject to arbitration by the Commission at large, because I suspect that's where the ACTU's starting point is. The other... <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. The other, <coughs> the other less uh, contentious, less hot uh, idea is to merely expand who can make Section 65 requests. So Lewis and I gave the list before, but you could expand it to uh, an employee on the basis of, say, their gender or their um, or their gender identity, or let's say uh, on their for their religious or um, indigenous Australians. Um, the other thing you could do, which I thought of myself, I mean, you could just open sixty five to everyone. Well, it's already open to such a large group of people. Once you've opened it up to over fifty fives and people with children of under school age, which is under eighteen and people with disability, there's actually quite a large group of society already covered by these flexible working arrangements. So it wouldn't be a, a significant difference to open up to everyone in a way. Um, so much to be seen here. I think this is one of the areas the government would like to move quickly on. Um, unlike I was saying, I think in relation to same job, same pay, 
that is such a a large area of um, consideration and new focus that I think that'll be next year. This may be this year. We, we probably come now to the meatiest topic of them all, um, a topic which is absolutely the focus of the ACTU and now the government. Uh, another one of those areas, Julian, where this wasn't part of the ALP election platform, um, notwithstanding your, your defence uh, or opposition to my comments earlier, Passionate but, comments. But, but was part of the ACTU's agenda and has been for some time. The ALP did not go to the election proposing multi-employer bargaining or industry-wide bargaining, at, and yet now it is talking quite openly about reforming in that area. Um, the, the, I suppose there's a few things we need to talk about here. As a starting point, what is industry bargaining? What, what is multi-employer bargaining? Um, th there are certainly calls from the union movement to say we want to increase bargaining in, in areas where there's low paid. We want to open up bargaining to areas where businesses and organisations haven't previously had the benefit of it. And the way to achieve that is through industry or multi-employer bargaining. But I think what that actually looks like, it's not actually clear at all that the ACTU has a, a predetermined view there. They certainly haven't identified it or articulated it. And I, I suppose it could look like a few different things. It could look like industry-wide bargaining. So that is, a, a union can kick off bargaining with presumably a, an employer organisation that represents an industry, whether that be a state chamber, whether that be a federal chamber, or like Australian Chamber of Commerce or Australian Industry Group, or whether that be a, um, a more industry association-based organisation, restaurant and catering association in the restaurant industry, the AHA in the hospitality industry, and, and they effectively, on one view, could bargain with them for terms to cover the entire industry. Now, uh, that's, one, that's one way of implementing it. Um, that would involve outcomes being imposed on businesses that have not really necessarily been involved or had the opportunity to give their own enterprise feedback into the bargain, and it, it actually starts to make the enterprise agreement not an enterprise-specific agreement at all. It makes them industry agreements, which, wait for it, are effectively just new forms of awards. So at its, at its most polarised position, industry-wide bargaining could be the imposition of effectively new industry awards across an industry that are negotiated by the unions and the employers and it would effectively make the modern award obsolete in reality. I think that's the polarised position. I think that's the extremity of what industry bargaining could look like. I don't think they're going to get there. I think the union movement probably realises that that is a, such a significant departure from the enterprise-specific bargaining we've had going on for some time that it may be a, a step too far. So then you go down to what we might call multi-employer bargaining. And so what that might look like is a, a number of employers that are operating in a common area or in, in common um, industry are the subject of bargaining notices from the same union and the union, rather than seeking to get a majority of employees to support bargaining at one enterprise, they actually target a number of employers, five, 10, 15, 20 at once, and seek to bargain with them collectively. Um, a lot of questions arise there. Can you take strike action across those multiple businesses? Um, if some em employers agree to the bargain but not others, do you then end up with an agreement across all of those employers or just the ones who've agreed? What happens if some workforces voted up and not others? All of these questions, it's a bit like same job, same pay. All of these questions about the logistics and about the technicalities, unanswered in the ACTU platform, unanswered in the many comments that have been made by Minister Burke about his support for now for this type of um, um, new wave of bargaining to be brought out, none of the detail is there at the moment. And I think that detail is, is going to be critical to working out just the level of impact this area has. Um, there's a lot of concern from employer groups that the prospect of industry-wide industrial action is not acceptable. And, and 
it's it's to quote some employer groups, it's it's a hill upon which they will fight and die in in the sense that that they will not lay down um, on the prospect of industry wide strike action because it would take us back many decades. And and I suspect that the government probably won't go that far. I think they they probably realise that if they allow industry wide strike action and in fact happens. That will be one of the few things that will probably guarantee them to become a one-term government. So, so I think they will steer away from industry-wide strike action. They haven't ruled out industry-wide bargaining. They haven't ruled out strike action for multi-business bargaining, so five or six. The other way this could be done, um, which is really kind of available presently, is basically the use of template agreements. And we've seen this a lot in the cleaning industry with the United Voice. Uh, using their clean start agreement. We see in the construction industry with the CFMEU using its template agreement. Uh, and what that looks like is you could have a template agreement that the unions um, agree to with one employer or with an employer organisation they believe is fair and reasonable. It gets stamped by the Fair Work Commission as being a fair, reasonable safety net of standards. And the unions effectively go from business to business seeking employers to sign up to that. And they might be able to use majority support determinations to try and compel employers to bargain on this template, or perhaps even industrial action. But, but what you're then talking about is one agreement being the template that is then um, effectively seen to, to try to be replicated at various industry, uh, in employers, and you might have some tinkering or bargaining around individual matters that might not work at that enterprise. But if the employers wish, they can just sign up to the template perhaps even without a vote, uh, not sure whether that's something the unions are considering. That's another way of achieving this multi-employer type approach where they want to try and open up bargaining access for businesses that traditionally haven't had it. I, I think I'm going to hand over to you in a moment, Julian, but I think that whichever type of approach is used, there's a few streams we've just talked about. The answer is it's coming. They want to open up. Uh, bargaining, particularly in low-paid areas. So we're talking about the care industries, aged care, childcare, um, probably some of the contracting industries, security, cleaning. They're going to be the focus, these lower-paid industries. And um, what's not yet clear is the mechanism, but there's a clear desire to introduce this. I think, that, I mean, the simple point is, the point of this is to increase bargaining is to increase the amount of enterprise agreements, more importantly, the, the amount of people covered under enterprise agreements. There are provisions in the Act already for multi-employer bargaining, low paid authorizations. They haven't really, they haven't hit the mark in terms, in fact, a lot of uh, bargaining, uh, and we can talk about the boot and we can talk about all kinds of different aspects of bargaining. A lot of the current machinery is not resulting in an increase in employees being covered by enterprise agreements. So that's what this is aimed at. Mm. Um, and I think to think about it and trying to pre predict where it will land, it is, the, it is the solution that will create the most amount of employees covered by enterprise agreements that will eventually win out. Um, oh, we've got, we've got then on, on, on the slide some of the ways in which the legislative change might occur. I think we've broadly covered we, that. We, we have. You mentioned that employers are going to die on the hill of industry-wide uh, strike action. And apropos of nothing, I thought about this on the train this morning. Um, the public, I don't think, are particularly interested in industry-wide yes. strike action. Um, for those of you who read the comments, for those of you who, 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 who try and gauge what the public think about these packages of this package of reform, I think in a lot of senses, the, the equity issues that we talked about before, uh, the concept of secure work, there's a, there's a, th th those things sound good and people feel comfortable with them. In terms of the other category, if you take equity, if you take uh, job security and you take uh, union influence, uh, increasing union relevance, um, the one thing that will really, I think really people will struggle with is the idea that an entire industry will be shut down, um, whether it's childcare or whether it's, um, whether it's, um, let's see, transport. transport. Yeah. Uh, that's a problem for people, which it, everyone will be very careful before, before putting an industry-wide strike action into this package mm. of reforms. There's a reason why it's not there. Yeah, um, although it hasn't yet been ruled out. 
We'll see. Um, now, bargaining, um, there's, this is a really interesting area. The, the, there's a real desire to provide support for employers and unions in bargaining, more support. That's likely to see a greater involvement of the Fair Work Commission. Um, so I'd probably like to see more funding for the Fair Work Commission to get involved in bargaining earlier. So whether it's by election of the parties or even unilaterally one party wanting to kick a matter into the commission, not necessarily to determine the outcome, I don't think, although that's a question whether we might get there, but but certainly to use its new approaches, uh, interest-based bargaining approach, to try and bring the parties together earlier and try to have a series of meetings to generate an outcome. And I think we'll see that um, probably that, that there'll be a desire to have the Fair Work Commission increase its role there. Now, I mentioned arbitration. Presently, there is a desire on the part of the ACTU, so you can take it as a desire part of the government, to see arbitration if possible. And what I mean by arbitration is if the parties can't agree on a particular package to put to the workers, that the commission has the right to unilaterally determine what the terms should be in that agreement by, by hearing the, the arguments of either side and then mandating an outcome. That would be a significant departure from the current regime. There hasn't been a, um, a confirmed commitment to introduce arbitration, but there, the word is being uttered in corridors uh, in the sense that we've heard it from the ACTU. And I think it's going to be, again, uh, a challenge for those representing employers to explain what the role of arbitration should be and whether it should be limited. Because in a worst case scenario, it could be that businesses that want to negotiate terms with the workforce and put those terms to a vote can't necessarily do so. If the unions don't agree to it, they might find themselves subject of an arbitration of the Fair Work Commission about what should be put to the employees. And it would be a significant departure from the current regime of enterprise bargaining, it makes a lot more process driven, uh, probably more money for lawyers, to be honest, in, in becoming involved in these areas of disputation. Um, and so I, I think that'll be a space to watch. Um, the other area that will definitely change, I think, is the simplification, the better off overall test. There is a real appreciation across both areas of the employer-employee divide that the test is currently too complicated. Um, it's complicated in two ways. Firstly, um, because the commission needs to be satisfied that every employee and every prospective employee will be better off overall under an enterprise agreement than they would be under the modern award. The Commission has to consider every hypothetical um, roster, roster or regime under which a person might be engaged to try and ascertain whether they'd be better off under the EA or the award. And so you have these, for employers, infuriating hypotheticals put up that, well, someone might work Saturday only and Sunday night only and in, in every public holiday, and if they do just that, then all of a sudden um, they're better off under the award than the EA because your loaded rate under the EA doesn't contemplate someone only working weekends. And the employer might say, well, I don't have people working weekends. They only work during the week. And, and there's been a real challenge in, in getting the balance right on assessing what the likely pattern someone's going to work is versus every possible pattern that might arise. And so a lot of employers have been required to give undertakings. A lot of employers have started to say that this whole bargaining system's too hard and are opting out. And so I think that's one area where the boot needs to be reformed. And uh, before I hand over to Julian, who looks eager to, to give his two cents on this, um, the, the other area of reform is that there still is, even though the test is better off overall, there is still too much of a line by line focus. So uh, that is if someone's part-time employment provision is not as uh, beneficial as the modern award, often in employers are told to give undertakings or else face their agreement fail. If the minimum engagement provision isn't the same, even though rates might be higher, redundancy benefits might be higher, all sorts of benefits that are important might be higher, the, the, the employers are told, given undertaking or this, all the boot will be failed. And I think there needs to be more flexibility about that. There needs to be more of an overall assessment of the terms and conditions and, and also greater emphasis given to contingent um, benefits like redundancy, like parental leave because the Commission is struggling to give those, those types of conditions weight in circumstances where not everyone will necessarily have access to them. So, so the government does need to get in there, it needs to get its hands dirty, and it needs to fix the boot. Sorry, Julian. 
No, not at all. You were on a roll. I mean, I was just going to say, I, I don't find the the boot approval process infuriating. It's it's really intellectually interesting for me as a lawyer. Awful for the business. Uh, these are all when every time you give an undertaking, that is an, a non bargained outcome. There is no trade off for the the undertaking that you've given. You haven't whether it's you're looking for productivity gains, whatever you're looking for. Um, every undertaking you give is something that uh, you receive nothing for in return. Returning to first principles, the aim of this will to be will to, will be to revitalise enterprise marketing. Now the balance will be. You do not want to, if you are the Labor Party or if you are the Greens or if, if you are the union movement, you do not want to undermine the purpose of the boot, which is to make people better off uh, than the modern award. Uh, but in doing so and how you precisely do that, that's the question. I mean, mm. clearly, when the boot was created, it was created with a view that, well, this will, this will work and it will be seamless and it will promote bargaining and everyone will be fine. That hasn't quite worked out. Um, how they tweak it and how they balance those two things will be very interesting to see. Um, insecure work. Uh, this is quite a broad topic. We've already tackled one area of insecurity, which relates to fixed-term contracts um, and, and the reforms there. There are other areas of work which are considered by the government uh, and the ACTU to be insecure. They primarily pertain to casual employment, as well as what we might call the gig economy um, and, and contracting more general, generally. Um, we're likely to see reforms in a few ways. Firstly, the government um, has already, I think, in its election platform, uh, committed to reviewing and changing the definition of a casual employee. So we've gone through a 10-year journey here on casual employment. We, we, we've, got, we've had a scenario where there was a lot of upheaval in response to a couple of cases in the mining industry, Workpack and Skeen, Workpack and Rosado, where um, employees engaged as casuals, paid a casual loading, um, clearly engaged on that basis, were nevertheless found to be permanents and were accordingly entitled to back pay of leave entitlement, so on and so forth. In response to that, the former coalition government uh, introduced a, a set definition of what it means to be a casual employee, so businesses had certainty as to which employees were casuals and which weren't. Now what we're hearing from the Labor government is they want to open this up again. They probably want to limit the ability of, of employees to be engaged as casuals where they are being employed regularly and systematically. The question is what's their new test going to look like? And again, how much does that put the identification of who is or who isn't a casual at risk? Um, how much does that put at risk an employer's ability to have someone work flexibly, to have them work regular hours a few weeks in a row, but then actually send them home early if they're, the bar's quiet at night, or to have them work regular hours, but then ramp those hours up if the employee can work and there's demand without having to pay overtime. And so that's, that's going to be an area of policy focus. I think we're going to see a new definition of casual employment. If we're lucky, it might go back to the common law and we can rely on the high court cases that have already given some guidance on this point. Uh, if we're unlucky, it might be a little bit more subjective and we might have this ongoing prospect of claims about someone's true status. And that's what we're really trying to avoid here. Certainty is good for, for business because people can rely on it and can make investment decisions on it. Uncertainty is often not considered to be attractive. So that's, that's the trade-off that needs to be, needs to be um, considered. And again, it's going to be a big area of input for, um, for organisations like the Australian Chamber uh, and, and others to try and, and ensure that the, the test is the right one. Um, the, the other areas that we're probably likely to see some area of reform is on the extent to which the Fair Work Commission can actually get involved in the ascertainment of someone's status. And so there might be a desire to, give, to get some opinion from the Commission or to give the Commission some binding powers to determine a person's status, for instance, as a casual or not. It's interesting because that would be a point in time assessment. One of the difficulties with this is, depending on what the test is, it can change over time. Yes. So hence the, the motivation bef behind the statutory test, which was to say a very short form of it, if the contract says you're a casual and the contract has the, the, the requisite aspects of casual work, you're a casual and everyone goes off and that's how they live their lives. Uh, 
changing over time because it's not based on the contract anymore could be very interesting, even for the Fair Work Commission. Yeah, and and look, so then we get to the gig economy and contracting work. Um, the there is clearly a desire to regulate gig work. We, we need to be careful about what we're talking here. People tend to think it's some broad reforms across all industries. It's probably going to be focused mainly on a couple of types of businesses. It's going to be focused on food delivery. It's going to be focused on the Uber type transportation scenario and probably product delivery. So your, your use of couriers and, and other types of contractors to deliver work, uh, sorry, deliver goods through some kind of uh, software platform. The world doesn't run on these delivery services, although more and more people are using them. There are a whole heap of other industries that might not be subject to, to this focus of gig work. I think the, that's the real area. It's, it's delivery, it's transportation of people. Um, that's probably the bigger part of what gig work is. Again, there's going to be a lot of effort involved in defining this. I think the government's going to need to be careful not to give a definition that's so broad that it automatically encompasses, encompasses all contracting. Because there's a lot of legitimate forms of contracting at the moment that aren't gig work. I mean, you look at tradespeople, plumbers, carpenters, electricians. Uh, they might use software platforms to connect and to find business, but I don't think anyone thinks the sparky that comes to their house to do half a day's work is an employee. They're a contractor, even though they might use software platforms now to meet uh, I can't believe you haven't mentioned owner drivers. So uh, you drop them to, to in, meet at the, do- at the drop of a hat. To meet their consumers. Owner drivers is, is another example. Um, the transport industry is rife with people who own very significant assets. They, these owner drivers are regulated in New South Wales, Vic and WA. I, I don't think there is any suggestion by the union movement that these owner drivers aren't su- subject to appropriate protections. Um, that there's quite a developed area of jurisprudence in some of the jurisdictions about these drivers. So I'd be surprising if all of a sudden these types of businesses got regulated. And again, it's going to come down to what the definition is. And I think, um, Julian, you're involved in the Fair Work Commission proceedings that Menulog involved in it, trying to have some of their delivery drivers classed as employees uh, subject to the award. I mean, that could be described as gig work, but but, but that's actually, they're actually employees. There are limits to what I can say, obviously, but it, it, it's it's the problem we have, the problem that needs to be fixed or that is intended to be fixed is the idea that there are contractors who, for whatever reason, uh, people say should be employees. One way of doing that is actually to make them employees or deem them to be employees. Another way of doing it is just to give the Fair Work Commission powers to regulate contractors who do, trendy name, gig work in the forms, in that kind of independent contractor, which for the various reasons which you've described, is not the traditional established forms of independent contractors. It's a new form of ind- independent contracting, which, to be honest, the Fair Work Act clearly doesn't contemplate because the Fair Work Act is generally for employees, but there aren't other industrial protections to regulate relatively low paid, um, relatively no asset employer, uh, employees, slip of the tongue, no asset contractors who are out there working what many see as as a job, as an employee, as an employer. And I think there's going to be some desire to have some universal standards. So perhaps a universal minimum wage for these workers, universal workers comp, probably access to sick leave. They're probably the types of entitlements that the union movement would probably like to see these contractors have, even if they're not going to be deemed employees, to have that as a universal entitlement. And again, the question is how broad is that going to go? How many contractors are going to get access to these universal entitlements. If we're, it could be a larger group than we're expecting. That's what remains to be seen. Um, finally, bang on time, and I think then we'll have time for any questions that you manage to muster, Julian. Um, the, the respect at work uh, piece. Um, it is very difficult to address this in a few minutes. Um, we've got one recommendation up there which is to clarify that sexual harassment is expressly prohibited. Um, I think it's already been included in part of the definition of serious misconduct, but there's a real desire to enable um, businesses to, to kind of be able to, or to, to, to be able to terminate on the basis of sexual harassment being se- uh, serious misconduct, but also for it to be expressly prohibited in an offence. Um, I, I think 
the the reality is there's going to be much, much broader reforms. There were 55 recommendations from the Jenkins review into uh, sexual harassment um, and female participation in the workplace. The ALP government has committed to introducing all 55. So recommendation 28, which we've got up there, is the tip of the iceberg. We're talking about clauses about pay secrecy being removed. We're talking about um, proactive duties to ensure that there isn't hostile workplaces to women. Um, We're talking about sex-based harassment, not just sexual harassment, but harassment based on sex being removed. We're talking about um, uh, provisions potentially about the use of non-disclosure agreements. So this is a huge area of reform. It's quite a big piece. It'll come pretty quickly, I suspect, because I think the government has mandate here. It was part of their election platform. The Liberal government actually was going to do most or many of the Jenkins reforms anyway. So we will see something come into Parliament possibly this side of Christmas, but it's just a lot of reforms. Yep. Um, anything else? On this, though, the, oh, on the, the Vic- our Victorian viewers probably are more au okay fait with the concept of a positive duty into, to, to, to eliminate sexual harassment. So for those in Victoria, probably ahead of the game, but for everyone else who are thinking about what this might look like, perhaps uh, reading about the Victorian experience might be very useful. Um, there are a couple of questions, noting the time. Uh, James says, is there any prospect of them changing the NERR? So, yeah, the, the NERR, so this is the Notice of Employee Representational Rights that needs to be handed out to employees when you commence bargaining. Early on, um, businesses had a lot of problems in getting EAs approved if there was some minor technical difficulty with the NERR. Um, if you had a, the wrong phone number on there, thankfully they've removed the phone numbers now. If you had it on a company letterhead, all of a sudden the whole process would be invalidated. Now, that has been reformed to some extent because the Fair Work Commission now has the power anyway to approve an agreement if the NER deficiency is a technical or minor one and didn't substantially disadvantage employees. They must e- approve the agreement in any event. So I really think that problem's gone away. But I think we'll see a broadening of that. I think we'll see a broadening of the Commission's power and discretion to approve agreements where it's satisfied in a broad sense there was genuine agreement, notwithstanding any technical deficiency. So I think to James, I think in my view, the problem with minor errors in the NERR has gone away largely, but to the extent it hasn't, that situation will be further improved by the reforms. Here's an interesting one. How will the abolition of pay secrecy clauses interrelate with the same job, same pay proposal? Well, it's interesting. I mean, the abolition of pay secrecy clauses um, doesn't really, I think it's not going to interrelate a a lot for this reason. It doesn't really relate to people on industrial instruments. So if you think about an enterprise agreement, generally the rates of pay are at the back. If you think about a modern award, the rates of pay are there. People paid on the instrument, generally they know what their classification is and their rate is with their rate in the instrument, particularly for EAs. And I think where we're really going to see same job, same pay have effect is where you have a labour hire workforce on one EA, there's a host workforce on a different EA and, and that's higher rate. And so the labour hire workforce want that higher rate. But the rates are currently publicly available there. Where pay secrecy kicks in is for above award or above instrument workers. You have more senior execs where there's the suggestion that by having pay hidden, um, the female part of the workforce, for whatever reason, the historical reasons, gender-based differences, are not necessarily getting the same rate of pay as ex- male executives in the same or similar roles, and that by having pay no longer secretive, that will be more drawn into light and be able to be evened up. Um, I think there's a few interesting things about that. I mean, just because sharing one's pay is no longer prohibited. I don't know the extent to which people are just going to go openly telling each other everyone's pay packets. It's, it's kind of an awkward topic of conversation. It will probably happen in some sectors. In others, it might still be quite a closely guarded secret by individuals. Um, but um, so I think, I think there'll be limited crossover, but absolutely um, there may be some because to the extent you're saying I want the same pay as someone else, and you think you're not getting it, then you you may be more easily able to go and ask people what they're earning. Noting the time, I think we're probably done. Well, look, thank you for joining us. Um, there was a, a whole heap of information to get through. 
Um, we will continue to update our clients uh, over the coming weeks and months as the reform agenda unfolds. Uh, I, as I said, we're being heavily involved and so we're going to have a, a very good perspective when the, the legislation comes out to really, to really give employers an understanding of what their obligations are. Um, we've got uh, a few webcasts coming up. We always time the parties, policies and problems for October. I'm, I think I'm meant to be doing that one, so we'll see if I, I, I stay on the list or whether so, I sub so, down. So that's to, to, to warm everyone up for the Christmas season and get you, get you in, in good shape for uh, not having any issues arise or at least liability arise if people go off, off, uh, off message. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, um, uh, and then we've also got uh, sexual harassment in the workplace training being conducted by uh, one of our senior associates, Tams and Lawrence, on the 16th and 17th of November, and we'll have a full 2023 ca training calendar come out so, so soon. So um, plenty more to come. And for, for today, though, thank you for joining us. And, Julian, thank you for subbing in. Pleasure.